you know, one of the things that a good friend of mine has coined is the word custodial leadership, which is an mm -hmm. idea where, you know, women yeah. of color come in with their, you know, brooms and their dustpans and are sort of allowed to clean up the house after the person before them has created a big fat mess, back to messy. So, you know, you reach a point in your career where you're like, I don't want to be the cleanup gal, right? Welcome to Student Affairs Now, the online learning community for student affairs educators. I'm your host, Mamta Akapati. Student Affairs Now is the premier podcast and learning community for thousands of us who work in, alongside, or adjacent to the field of higher education and student affairs. We release new episodes every week on Wednesdays. Find us at studentaffairsnow.com, on YouTube, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. This episode is sponsored by Leadershape. Go to leadershape.org to learn how they can work with you to create a just, caring, and thriving world. This episode is also sponsored by Vector Solutions, formerly EverFi, the trusted partner for over 2,000 colleges and universities. Vector Solutions is a standard of care for student safety, well-being, and inclusion. Stay tuned to the end of the podcast for more information about each of our sponsors. As I mentioned, I'm Mumta Akapati, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am broadcasting to you today from Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas is situated on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Humanos, the Coahuiltecan, Comanche, Lipan Apache, and Tonkawa peoples. So about today, this is a dream come true moment for me. To have the opportunity to be in shared space with Desi and South Asian pioneering women, educators in student affairs and beyond is just such a gift. As you all may know, this is my first episode with Student Affairs Now, and I wanted it to be an episode that honored the wisdoms, celebrated the triumphs, owned the privileges, and acknowledged the traumas of our lives and lineage journeys. I'm equal parts nervous, excited, and just plain in awe of this moment and this collective of women. <laughs> Dear sisters, thank you so much for being together um, today um, in this episode of Student Affairs Now, and welcome to the podcast. So uh, before we, or as we're beginning, um, can you begin by telling us a little bit about you and your current role? And for, because we are a collective, large collective, I'm gonna I'll call on us. So Smita. Well, first of all, I am also just delighted to be in the presence of my sisters uh, who give me strength, inspiration, and courage every day. I love you all, and I'm just so excited about um, the time that we're going to spend just sharing our stories. Um, my name is Smita Ruzika. I use she, her, hers pronouns, um, and I, uh, for my job, work at Middlebury College, uh, where I serve as the Vice President for Student Affairs, uh, Middlebury, Vermont sits on um, the ancestral lands of the Abenaki nation um, and the land and waters here are, um, uh, you know, are to, and tell the story of the Abenaki tribe um, that, and they call this um, Indakina their homeland. Um, perhaps the most important job that I have is being the mother to five-year-old Rohan Ruzika. Um, and so um, he is definitely someone that teaches me so much um, and um, I'm excited to share uh, just my stories today. Awesome. Pia. Hi, folks. My name is Pia Bose. <clears throat> Excuse me, pronouns she, her, hers. And uh, Mamta, thank you so much for putting this together. This is <clears throat> something that, you know, when I started my career, I could never imagine being in a space with this yes. many Desi mm -hmm. folks. And yes. this is special. This is really special. So thank you for bringing us together. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and in about a month, <clears throat> excuse me, I will be starting as the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs at UC San Diego, which mm -hmm. I'm very excited about. And for the time being, uh, I'm joining you all from Huntington Beach, which is the ancestral lands of the Tongva and Ahachiman folks. So again, thank you, and I'm excited for this. All right, let's go to Sumi. Good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone. It is so good to be with everyone. I am i don't know if you can see my smile. I'm just so happy yes. right now. I, and, you know, here uh, based in Burbank, California, right outside of Los Angeles, I'm with you today from my home um, in Burbank, uh, sitting on Gabrielino or Kij Nation, Tongva and Chumash land. 
And I was running around this morning, slightly frantic, trying to get my two little ones ready and out the door. I've got a nine-year-old or almost 10-year-old Shashivir and my four-year-old, she just turned four a few days ago, Shama Shakti. Um, and by the way, <laughs> I probably should have given her name like maybe Shanti or Sushma. <laughs> Like because the Shakti was in full force this morning, <laughs> that feminine energy and strength and power. So I rushed into this room and then immediately this room of the six of us and immediately just felt. And that's a, that's a real blessing to be able to be in the space together. So my name is Suman Lakshmi Pendikur. My pronouns are she, hers. Um, I most recently was serving as the chief learning officer at the USC Race and Equity Center, um, working on the question of scalable racial equity and social justice. But two years ago, I launched my own practice, uh, Soman Pendikur mm -hmm. Consulting, a very original name. But I <laughs> love what I get to do working with uh, corporations, higher ed institutions, nonprofits, foundations all across the country and the world now. So it's been a real, real joy to transition that part of my career and draw from, you know, 20 years, as many of us have in the field um, to now apply all over. So great to be here. I'm looking forward to the smack talking portion of today, by the way. <laughs> awesome. That's beautiful. Okay, next, Shadia. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here. So honored to have the opportunity to be among people who really deeply have impacted me in my own journey in higher ed. Um, Thank you. I'm just really happy about, about this opportunity. Uh, so Shadi Sachidina, uh, have, uh, I'm currently uh, pronouns as she, her, hers. Uh, and uh, I am speaking to you from my home in Westchester, New York. Uh, and where I live and where I'm situated, it is actually in Mamaroneck. Um, and so I'm sitting on um, and learning on and working on the unceded ancestral homelands of the Lenape, uh, Mohawk, uh, Siwanoi, Wapinja, and Mamaroneck peoples. Um, and um, I've lived in New York for the last 30 plus years of my life uh, and have worked in student affairs higher education in New York for almost three decades as well. Uh, most recently, until about six months ago, I was serving as the Associate Vice President for Student Affairs and the Dean of Students at FIT with the State University of New York. And currently um, I am serving as a consultant with Keeling and Associates, uh, a higher education consulting firm that works um, with colleges and universities to create change for learning. Um, I have um, a 20 year old, she just turned 20 wow. last Saturday, <laughs> wow. um, who is a sophomore in college at NYU, not too far away from me, thank God. Uh, I get to see her and have coffee with her and she still likes me. And so we get to spend time together. Uh, and I get to um, see what life on the other side of, of student affairs is like. I'm in higher ed adjacent now. Uh, and so I get to see things from a different perspective and uh, really excited to be here and have this conversation with everyone. Thank you. Shruti. Hi, y'all. Uh, Shruti Desai, she, her pronouns, uh, serve as Associate Vice President of Student Engagement for Student Affairs, one of those long titles at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, Duke University and Durham sit on occupied lands of Haliwa, Suponi, Suponi, and Okanichi Band of Suponi, um, and still got lots of work to do there. So, um, yeah, this this squad is mighty, and I it's a great way to start the week and start the morning, and um, as I enter kind of, you know, this new role and uh, the new role of parenting that we'll be taking on soon. Um, these are the mighty group of women that I will be turning to um, for advice and have often turned to for the big life moments of what in the world am I supposed to be doing and help me figure out a path. So I'm really grateful um, for this crew. Oh, wow. So um, again, thank you all so much. Shruti, I think you actually led, led us into kind of my first set of curiosities or just moments of reflection, which is, I'm just going to borrow your words. This squad is mighty. Uh, and so can we just, I mean, uh, you know, take in this, like, just take a moment to soak in this particular moment. I would love to hear from y'all. What does it mean for you to be in this space right now? You know, what do you see as the power of this group? Um, you know, what does, yeah, just what does this mean for us? I can start us off. Yeah. Um, so the, the two words that come to mind really potently are um, representation and possibilities. Um, and anyone who knows me knows that when I talk about representation, of course, representation matters. But I often say that representation is the floor, not the ceiling. 
of everything we need and desire in the world. But the representation does matter. And so I was thinking um, just a couple of weeks ago that 2002 was my very first NASPA annual conference in Boston. I was not dressed warmly enough. And uh, and th this wasn't there, right? Um, no, it and, was and, not. And really, broadly <laughs> speaking, you know, as, as a really proud Asian American, South Asian American, Desi woman, multiple of those spaces were not there. Mm -hmm. right. Meaning people simply weren't there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's been, I think, efforts inside and outside, right, to, to cultivate that. Um, and so to be able to sit with a total of uh, six women who have uh, some somewhat, quote unquote, seniority or seasoning in the field, if you want to call it that, right? Masala. We have masala. Masala. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me take off my dog. Sprinkle it on all of us. That, I think there is some meaning to be held in that. Just, and that, yeah. that, that relates to this question of possibilities, right? And so for all of us, we have striven to be something for others. And we have also sacrificed sometimes along the way in um, in yeah. sometimes ways that one mm -hmm. hopes that today's and future generations won't have to, right? Um, yeah. And we've also been possibility models for multiple communities, right? Um, not just what you visibly see in terms of Desi women, but also queer women, women with children, you know, women who are tackling the questions of racial injustice or systemic injustice in our institutions. So representation and possibilities, that's what that's what this space means to me today. So thanks for posing mm -hmm. that question, Mamu. I think the, for me, the wisdom in this space, just yeah. like collective years, but like also the ancestral wisdom that each of yeah. us just carries and how we, I think there's, you know, yes, we're all South Asian women or, you know, Desi women and the way each one of us approaches life is different, but you see pieces of our culture in each one of the ways we take it on. And I think that's the beauty of this group is um, we're not a monolith, uh, even though sometimes folks confuse each one of us for each one of us. Um, but the I think <laughs> there is this beauty in that of um, we hold our the values of our identities in different ways and, and navigate it differently. And I think that's a really cool thing to see. And there's no one way to do this. And I think that's freeing in a lot of ways. You know, what we're, oh, yeah, oh. Go ahead. no, go ahead. Um, I think for me, um, the words that are coming to mind are visibility, strength and courage, um, because I think to shoot these and Sumi's point, um, I think so many times um, I know, I know for sure Mumta and I have had this experience. <laughs> That's never um, happened, ever. Because, <laughs> because there are so few of us, mm -hmm. um, you know, there is this sort of uh, assumption that we're, we all have the same experience. Um, yeah. And there have been many spaces, um, and I, you know, I sort of was joking, but I'm really not. There have been many spaces yeah. where some of us have been mistaken for the other, right? which happens yes. a lot to folks from underrepresented identities. Um, and it happens a lot, especially when there's literally just a handful of us. Um, so I've been in spaces yes. where I've been called Mamta or um, Sumi or yeah. Shruti, and I'm sure that has happened to all of you. And so for me, the importance of visibility um, in our own identities and our collective identities is what's powerful about this group coming together. Um, I think the experiences of women, women of color, and then you layer on South Asian women mm -hmm. or um, you know, they see women is one of oftentimes invisibility. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And to be able to say, no, we are here um, and yeah. we are leaders on our campuses and our in our areas um, and we are mentors um, and that we also have a different, we've all had a different path and a different story is really important. And I and I do think for me the courage and strength piece is to oftentimes deal with some of that nonsense and I call mm -hmm. it nonsense. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and to, um, you know, to respond with it in our own ways, um, but also to, to really understand what it means to be in spaces where there's lots of assumptions placed on you, where you have to really say, no, I'm here and I am different yes. um, than yes. what you're thinking I am. Right. Um, or, you know, oftentimes us being the folks who are oftentimes doing the labor, mm -hmm. emotional labor. Uh, the work behind the scenes, but who gets to be the face of 
sort of the credit um, that gets taken. So yeah. I think that's what's powerful for me about this group coming together. So true. You know, this is an interesting time for me, right? Because I, I'm getting ready to start a new position. And I can think of not that long ago, I'm talking like a handful of years ago, spending time with women in this group and being like, oh my gosh, one day I want to be like them, right? Like huge eyes and holy crap, how do I get to be like these women? And what's fascinating for me right now is as I share folks with folks about my new upcoming position is I see that same look in folks' eyes when they're yes. in its excitement, there's pride. And then it also comes back to me a little bit of like, oh crap, I can't screw this up. And I'm yes. having a little bit of that right now, right? Yeah. There's some pressure that comes with being one of few mm -hmm. and knowing that, um, you know, even if they get my name mixed up with one of you fantastic people, uh, I would be honored for the record. And uh, <laughs> there's still just so few of us that if, if there's something major that I screw up, I know that it is going to have an impact on the entire community and those those young folks who are looking up with their big eyes saying, I want to do this someday. And that, mm -hmm. that feels like a little bit of pressure. And mm -hmm. it's good to know that I've got you fabulous women in my life to, to help me with the transition and the next step. So uh, I know I've got folks looking out for me. What's interesting, right? Because, um, uh, you know, as Smitha talks about invisibility, uh, Pia, what you kind of described is hypervisibility. And I feel like mm -hmm. it's the, the, the being hyper visible and invisible at the same time. And, and, um, and, and finding both the joy and the stress, like, you know, it's not as mm -hmm. clean, right. As, as exactly. you just articulated. Yeah. You know, I, I would also add on to, to what folks have been saying is that coming to the United States as an international student, which was my, which is like my story, you know, mm -hmm. come here 32 years ago, 1990, I, I'm Pakistani, was born in Pakistan, grew up in Kuwait, came here right during the invasion, right before, and mm -hmm. sort of really um, like jumping right into that whole idea of, you know, service, like how can I be of help? Because of what I looked like and what I kind of represented, sort of just feeding right into that automatic way of people thinking about how someone who's South Asian from Pakistan or India, I'm just going to mush the two countries together, should be. And yeah. completely being a passive, yeah. passive uh, participant in mm -hmm. that thinking. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I went along with it, thinking, you know, yeah. yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to be of service. I'm supposed to help. And it was only after many years of working in the field and doing the work and still doing the work and attending conferences and finally seeing people like you sort of come through the ranks and realizing, wait a minute, it doesn't really have to be that way. Like it, there is mm -hmm. space to say, no, yes, I will serve, but I will also do it on these terms and with this face and with this voice and be able to be okay with saying this and that. Where I think in the past, it was almost like, just shut up, go sit in the corner and do your work and keep quiet. But now there's this almost this permission. And I, and I, and I think being in this group, back to the original question, is it's given me permission to be okay with speaking up and standing up and, and talking more loudly and more defiantly about what should be happening because I am part of this country too. Mm -hmm. And I think it took me a while to realize that I'm more than just a guest or I'm just here by the good graces of the American government mm -hmm. because, hey, look, mm -hmm. I got a green card. Oh, thank you, God, I got a green card. And oh, look, mm -hmm. five years now, I can take my citizenship and I can take my oath of allegiance. Thank you, God. But now it's like, well, hell yeah. I am mm -hmm. part of this place and I do have a voice and I do have a right um, and a duty right. to speak up. Mm -hmm. I think it becomes a duty and not just this, should I, maybe? Yeah, so absolutely. Also, I, I vote for Shadia, by the way, who went ahead yeah. and erased the scar of partition. So I'm- Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, yes. absolutely. Yes. And, and, and leading us into really, I mean, I think uh, what moves me here is we're all unfolding um, into uh, you know, uh, we're, we're unfolding into ourselves as we write our own stories and to be able to do that with one another mm -hmm. is um, really, really meaningful. And so as, as we kind of all reflect on that, you know, who we're all trying to be, um, what comes up, you know, what comes up for you? 
as you navigate that journey? I can uh, jump in on a couple of things. I think um, it's interesting when I got this job and, you know, um, my mom, when I told my parents, my mom's first <laughs> question was, where is Duke? And I was like, oh man, okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, like she doesn't know this world yeah. of higher education and these prestigious schools and, um, which is cool. Um, but she also, and then I told her about the job and, you know, salary and all of that. And, she said to me, Shruti, when is it going to be enough? And I was like, as the kid of immigrants, like this is what I have been socialized to do is grind, make the money, have big titles. And so for my mom, you know, we grew up like middle class, low income. Um, for my mom to say that it, for me, I had to really reflect on like, what am I doing here? Um, have I sold out to this like capitalistic climb the ladder kind of thing? Um, or do I really believe in what I'm doing? Um, and that there are still days that I, after a long day, I'm like, what in the hell am I doing? Um, and is it worth it? Um, and now becoming a new parent and all of those. So I think it, for me, it is, you know, unlearning this like immigrant, kid of immigrant narrative of, I need to honor my parents with all these sacrifices and grind and do all of these things. And for my mom, who is like the hardest working person I know, um, to say, Shruti, when is it going to be enough? I think was really for me a moment of like, man, I need to reconsider uh, what my values are and why I am doing this. And I don't have an answer to when is it going to be enough. I don't know what enough is, but I need to really consider that and think about that. So I think that's what I'm I'm trying to be is what's my enough um, and in all sorts of ways um, and thinking about how to honor my family with that answer as well. That, that notion of kind of enoughness of being is such a, a powerful one um, because, I, you know, I join you in that. I mean, there's this, um, where did we receive the messages, right? To achieve, achieve, achieve. Um, and yet we just literally a few minutes ago talked about being present and knowing the impact of what that is for, <laughs> for a mm -hmm. generation of folks that, you know, just like we didn't have that and we see folks, you um, recognizing our visibility and what it means to them. But it's always um, to go back to um, what Shadia said, like it, the, the message is always serving the other, like serving other, serving other. So mm -hmm. it, the, the, the combination of messages as we're trying to become who we're supposed to be is, is interesting. And I think the question also arises is, how can I be truly useful, but also be of use to me? So it's it's, I know my purpose here is to is to is to be of service and and to do big things for 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 helping others, but how can I do it in a way that is also going to be fulfilling to to my way of living and to shoot his point, you know, true to my own values and what I believe is is true. Mm -hmm. So you're not necessarily just serving the serving for the money or 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 for the outward successes that life sort of promises, you know, mm -hmm. like the 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 lifetime achievement award, the, yeah. the, um, you know, the big bonus at the end of the year, if we even get that, it, it, is, is it more, can, can I be more fulfilled than just those outward extremities? Mm -hmm. uh, because in the end, I'm really not very happy when that that's the case. Yeah, absolutely. So can, so we kind of, oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, what I, I was going to add the, I think the, the, the whole, like, am I enough? gets even amplified and um, nuanced and complex as we think about our identities as South Asian American women. And I specifically say yes. South Asian American because, um, you know, like Shadia, I was an international student. So I was an immigrant coming here, right? Uh, and again, we don't have monolith experiences, um, yeah. but, you know, I've spent most of my life here uh, and I've had to balance sort of the Desi American, Desi American identities. And there are so many days where yeah. I just feel like I cannot get the right balance. Um, so this constant mm -hmm. place of feeling imbalanced. And part of that experience is, um, you know, as I heard Shruti talk, I thought about my own father uh, and his reaction to me getting this job at Middlebury. Prior to Middlebury, I was at Johns Hopkins. And believe me, when I got the job at Johns Hopkins, it was the first time my parents really didn't care or didn't really care <laughs> to understand what I did. It was Johns Hopkins and everybody in India knows Johns Hopkins. And so they were like, my daughter's at Johns Hopkins. 
you know, and she's the dean, right? She was the dean of students. When I moved to Middlebury, you know, I, I got a promotion. I became a VP. First of all, my parents didn't know what that really meant. So having to explain to our families what we do, uh, mm -hmm. it's complex enough. But then I was moving from Johns Hopkins to a, a place no one had really heard back, in, you know, where my parents are. Uh, and then if they found out Vermont. Um, and the only way my father could center his understanding about Vermont was he knew about Bernie Sanders. So <laughs> thanks, Bernie. My father was like, okay, she's moving to someplace legit, right? I, I share that story because, you know, I think my father, who w w served the United Nations for 40 plus years, um, always gets really panicky and anxious for me whenever I make a move. Because in his mind, yeah. as many of you, you know, the right path is to stay with that one place, yes. you know, yes. be loyal, um, get your gold watch or your plaque at the <laughs> end of your retirement. You know, uh, in India, you have this con concept of your provident fund, Providence Fund, your retirement, right? Mm. So just even wrapping their heads around this is complex. And, you know, for, for me, it's when I think about enough, I'm always thinking, are my parents proud? And I know they are, but if they don't understand my decision sometimes, um, it's really hard. And then on top of that, you know, I think as a South Asian woman, always having this um, message sort of burned into a psyche that you have to take care of everyone. Um, yes. And what do you do when you play outside of that role? And by that, you know, I have a partner who's been the primary caretaker of our child. He spent um, time, you know, at, at, at home when our, our, our son was born. He is the primary, you know, person that gets called to get him out of school. He cooks, he does all the grocery. And um, that's that's a huge reason why I can do what I do. But for my family, that's always been really hard uh, mm -hmm. to have my husband be the person who's doing these things that really were, are supposed to be things I should be doing. And so I've had to sort of always precariously balance about how can I be the best professional, but mm -hmm. also how can I be the best wife daughter, mother, and what happens when I'm not playing those traditional roles? Yeah. That's really powerful. I think one of the things, you know, when we were um, prepping for our initial conversation, mm -hmm. one of the themes that kept running through was the amount of unlearning that so many yes. of us are uh, mm -hmm. attempting to, to take on at this particular point in our lives. And I think that you know, many of us from all different communities go through periods of unlearning, relearning, mm -hmm. discovering, whatever you want to call it. But that the unlearning is, um, it is really powerful when you have the space to be able to engage in it. And it's also destabilizing and scary sometimes because you're not yeah. necessarily sure what it is you're quote unquote learning towards, right? Yes. Um, and so there's this necessary space of floating, um, of yeah. figuring out, well, where, where do I land on um, what roles I hold, like Smita was talking about, or what identities I carry, or how I present myself in the world, or how do I want to, you know, advance that high achieving mindset that my dad cultivated in me, et cetera, et cetera. I have a slightly different story in that uh, I come from an academic family. My dad's mm -hmm. a professor. He went on to become a dean at three different institutions. Um, and so he's really inculcated in me and my brother, and a lot of you out in the field know my brother too, Vijay Pendekur, also in student affairs. Um, but he's not a Desi queen, so he can't be here. And <laughs> um, and inculcated the idea of um, uh, changing, shaping, and building institutions, right? Whatever context I was in, I carried that. So whether I was an assistant director all the way mm -hmm. to becoming a vice president, that idea of um, shattering, shifting, shaping, building was really deeply ingrained in me. And that is hard work, hard work, yes. especially if you are going up against <clears throat> various stacked systems that are um, built in, baked into so many of our institutions. My dad's also a Marxist, so taught me a lot about the political economy of our institutions. And that helped me to understand how these landscapes change, shift, or don't shift. But, but I will say that that, to bring it back to this question of who am I trying to be, I think at this particular moment as, you know, a 46-year-old Desi woman, mommy of two, I am very deep in that place of unlearning so many scripts yeah. and so many places that I've fallen back on and trying to figure out, well, um, where do I want to make choice? And maybe I will return to some of those because those are more yes. choice-based scripts versus 
cultivated script. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll put that out there. What's interesting, right, uh, Sumi, as you talk about this idea of floating, um, we've, uh, I'm not trying to sound like the movie It, but we all float in different ways. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, so I think about how we float and navigate within, uh, many of y'all have already brought this up, kind of uh, w within the different identities um, that we present or manifest and, and um, have. How, how do you all come to understand those identities? You know, um, again, we've talked about di different contexts, but I, you know, I, I know that from our, for, as we were prepping for the conversation, just thinking about our racialized identities, right? Um, and how that plays out in hypervisibility, invisibility, how that plays out in how we um, use our voices um, in, in spaces, um, how certain expectations might be ascribed to us. So I, I would I would love to to hear, you know, how did you, you know, come to your own understanding of racialized identity? Um, when did you see yourself in a racialized context? And how does that kind of play out for you in in, in your day in and day out realities now? I think I, so I was born and raised in the U.S. And my parents first immigrated to Miami where there are lots of brown folks. Not all brown folks are Indian. That took a long time for me to learn. Uh, not very long, but, it, <laughs> yes. you know, folks would come up to me and start speaking in Spanish, assuming that I could speak Spanish. And I would look at my parents and I would say, oh, they're speaking Indian, right? This is when I was little. Uh, and... I, at that moment, I don't think I knew what was going on, right? But I remember, I have those memories, which means that they were mm -hmm. points of uh, importance in my life and growth and development. And the honest truth is my parents made a solid decision to, to anytime we moved, we were always in relatively diverse communities. There were always Indian folks around. There was always temples around. And then I took the leap and I moved uh, after college to rural Northern California. And, yeah. and, and that was a whole new uh, experience for me, quite frankly. And, you know, I had lived all these places where I've always seen brown folks, black folks, Indian folks, temples. And then I moved to a community that absolutely bastardizes our culture too right these are yeah. these are a lot of hippies up there who take our religion our culture our traditions and appropriate them in in some of the worst ways and i lived in that community for four years and uh that was my first time living in a rural community and that light of a community and every single day i felt my race and ethnicity uh and and, you know, on the other flip side of it is for the students, my presence, just my existence yes. right there yes. and my, my brown skin being there made a difference. Um, that was a hard thing to have to balance and figuring mm -hmm. out, right? The personal and the professional, right? Why I do this work. I do this work to support underrepresented students and communities, right? Education mm -hmm. changes the world when there's access and success involved. And to know where to go and to do that in a place where I can also be myself in a way that I don't feel like I'm being mm -hmm. attacked everywhere I go is also a challenging situation. It, there's a conflict there of where do I go? What do I do? And how do I do this? And I don't, I don't know what the answer is. If any of you do, please let me know. Mm -hmm. In context, Sumi's uh, consulting services. Or <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, um, for me, I was an international student. Um, I had lived around the world again because of my dad and his uh, work with the UN. And so, you know, I felt that I had been, I had grown up around a lot of different people. I'd gone to an international boarding school in India. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, we didn't really talk about diversity. We lived in a very diverse place. Um, and coming to the US, uh, I ended up in San Antonio, Texas, which, you know, that'll take a whole other podcast to unpack. Um, <laughs> you know, coming to San Antonio, my notions of Texas were informed by Walker, Texas Ranger, and Dallas, the TV yeah. show. I was not thrilled to come to Texas. I'll just say that. But my sister was here. <laughs> but I just remember to think about race. I, I felt like I was hit over the head with who I am in terms of a racialized way. This was the first time in my life where I had to check all these boxes, where I had to talk about my race. And as I looked at the options, 
the one I was told that I had to pick was Asian American. And that made mm-hmm. no sense for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if there was a box that said brown, I'd happily check that. Uh, and mm-hmm. again, similar to, you know, Pia, I landed in Texas, but there were a lot of brown people. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but most of them were not Indian or South Asian. Um, but I was told you have to check the Asian American box. And as I started my college career, as I started doing more research into Asian Americans, I continued to not see folks that looked like us. Um, right. And so I sat and I really I felt uncomfortable with having to check that box. But everywhere I went, you know, race was such a huge um, part of who one person was, um, you know, and, and again, as a counselor, um, being one of very mm-hmm. few folks in mental health, um, you know, whether it's Asian Americans or South Asian, there was no conversation about mental health with Asian nope. Americans or South Asian nope. Americans. Um, and so I felt, I've oftentimes felt that I've had to sort of learn what does race as a construct mean here in the US? Um, mm. And then where do I fit in? And even in those places that I'm supposed to fit in, how do I find myself? Um, and how do I sort of connect to that identity and also serve mm-hmm. to, um, you know, be be someone in coalition uh, yeah. with, with that big group, right? Um, and that was a huge learning moment. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah. 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 It's so interesting because I didn't have the words like um, I didn't have maybe the the identified words. I grew up in all black neighborhoods uh, through my childhood. So I'm I'm just kind of accustomed um, to an environment where my environment was predominantly black. um, And my father worked at an HBCU. So like literally my world is predominantly people of color predominantly black. And then of course, socially within um, Sindhi, South Asian, Indian communities. And so um, uh, and yet there is a lot of anti-blackness kind of written right into the story and narrative. And mm-hmm. I know that, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that as well, but I think about, you know, like always being in this, um, this, uh, you know, uh, in, in black, white spaces in, in, in some ways, but also not being able to, like, I think the first time it was where I was going with this, that I recognized that I needed to use my voice differently, um, truly was was 9-11. So mm-hmm. in 2000, I mean, I knew that I had the skills to use my voice. I could facilitate things, right? There was a skill site that I had. Um, and I almost feel like I was like, oh, that's nice, Mamta, and she's moderate, and she can have these conversations in very friendly, fluffy ways, right? Um, and then when 9-11 happened, and there was not the same, not even the same, a comparable level of alarm for the mental health for the violence, right? Kind of in my very real lived experience in ways that I hadn't personally experienced before, it activated something different in me about the way that I needed to speak up in, um, uh, Smitha, to use your uh, words, coalitional spaces and ways. And also where are people joining me and us and our collective communities as all of this is happening? What, you know, um, where where is that coalitional approach as well? So so it's kind of messy. I mean, as I hear y'all reflect, I'm, I'm I need to take ownership of that messiness in my own upbringing. I I will say I think that messiness has uh, that messiness is the is totally the right word, right? There's very mm-hmm. little that is like flat or unnuanced unnuanced about any of our individual relationships to the construct of race and then how it plays mm-hmm. out in moments of crisis like 9-11 or in the day-to-day you know wherever we live mm-hmm. whether it's up in Humboldt state area or in San Antonio um I similarly grew up in a um largely black neighborhood right outside of Chicago the first suburb outside of uh Chicago is a town called Evanston and so interestingly you know my parents um immigrated uh, back in 1969 uh, probably very similar to some of mm-hmm. your parents as well, for those of us who were who were born here. Um, and some of my first memories of growing up there were about being very Indian, very distinctly brown uh, yes. in a uh, hyper black white binary. We lived in a more mm-hmm. sort of white, uh, slightly more affluent part of town for my first few years growing up in the north side of Evanston. And then when my parents could finally afford a house it was in the south side of Evanston which was Mm -hmm. less affluent and more black um and therefore my school was more black and it had various kinds of diversity but this was the most prominent you know sort of feature um 
and we used to go back and forth a lot because my dad's research, he's a, he's a film professor. And so we used to go back and forth a lot to specifically to Karnataka, I'm a South Indian, a Kanadiga, um, and be rooted there for many, many, many months. So I was very, very Indian, right? I'm starting in grade school, middle school, right? I'm talking about in the eighties and early nineties wearing Indian yes. clothes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but in that black, white binary really being constructed very much as, as, other yes. and many many south asians did not want to live in evanston because they would openly say well there's too many black people there oh, yeah. because the anti-blackness in so many of our communities is rampant and through the roof right while we do yes, have so yes. many particularly in our and younger generations and even older generations coalitional activism there is right. this rampant ugly streak yes. which is you know so tied to hindutva so tied to casteism so tied to brahminical tradition so tied to you know, race, hatred, et cetera. But they would openly say, no, we don't want to live there. We want to live in Oak Park, Arlington Heights, Schomburg, et cetera. For those of you who know the north side of Chicago. But I will say that was sort of a crucible place to learn. Um, and it wasn't always nice, right? Um, yes, some yes. of the worst bullying I experienced was from some of the Black students, right? So this isn't all a nice right. and pretty story of, Oh, black and brown, brown like recognize, like game recognize, yes. game. No, that wasn't necessarily there, what was yes. <laughs> no. there was some punching yeah. down because people are always looking for who to punch down on. And we see that in sort of the body politic in our current moment, right? Um, but I will say this again, live growing up in the family I grew up in, for my dad to be able to sit down at the dinner table and to be able to explain racism, class stratification. Mm -hmm. Why do people uh choose to look for someone quote unquote lower than them on the social hierarchy help to put a cognitive structure over some of the real pain that I was mm -hmm. experiencing it doesn't take away the pain it helps to understand it right but my honest real politicization was built on top of that in college so I got involved directly yeah. in my freshman year with the struggle for Asian American studies so mm -hmm. interestingly bookending from what Smitha said I came into my Asian American identity strong at age, you know, 18, 19, because I saw that as a political yeah. identity, not my cultural identity, but a political identity where we could build coalitions to understand ourselves as racialized vis-a-vis -vis U.S. nation state <clears throat> policy practice, et cetera, which gave me more of a window to figure out, ah, how do I now relate to fellow communities of color, queer and trans communities, disabled communities. So it was sort of this, you know, like you said, messy, winding, um, yeah. bouncy kind of journey around the narrowest aspects of identity to the sort of breadth and depth of coalitional identity, but like how that's how that's been like a wellspring that's fed me for, mm -hmm. you know, 25 years now and continues to inform me as mm -hmm. I learn and unlearn. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, I appreciate that piece around coalition building. To me, is the I think the other piece we don't anti blackness is very prominent in our community. The other piece that we don't often think about is the homophobia that runs rampant in our community. Yes, right? absolutely. Um, the number of I'm queer. I have the best wife in the whole world. Um, and the number of folks who are like, oh, you should go talk to Shruti. She's queer and Indian. Oh, you should go talk to Shruti. She's... Mm -hmm. And I have a family uh. that's accepted, that loves my wife, that is stoked about being grandparents. Um, and the again, this monolith of like, yeah. because yeah. you're Indian and queer, it, of course you have a shared experience and I can understand, I can have empathy, but like there's so many folks who are closeted. There's so many. And even when I came yes. out, I was like, I can't be Indian and queer. So for the sake of my, like me wanting to be queer and wanting to embrace that identity and um, find a partner, I was like, let me put the Indian kind of ness of this really important yeah. cultural piece. Um, grew up in a very Hindu household um, aside and just be, let me like sell out to whiteness and all of these other things so I can also be queer and I think there's a lot of pain in that for folks that we don't talk about. And thankfully, mm -hmm. you know, my dad, mm -hmm. when I came out to my parents, I was in my mid, late thirties, um, mid thirties. And um, he said, your Indian women, their whole reason they raise daughters is so they marry someone who's good. And that's the value of being a mom. And I was like, this is some buckwass, right? Like, 
this yes. is <laughs> um and I was like dad I'm marrying one of the best humans on the planet like y'all don't know you know yeah. um but I think there's so much of that in our like this is what yeah. a woman's supposed to be you're supposed to marry yeah. a good Indian doctor man Gujarati Hindu Hindu Brahmin doctor whatever man. yeah right like <laughs> not lady doctor doctor not man. Lady. Uh, lady yeah oh. I'm like what <laughs> all of our ceremonies are for men and women all you know like it's just wild <laughs> um and I, I so I think there's so much of that intersectional of like we can have empathy for one another we often choose not to um we can coalition build and give all of us liberation we often choose not to um and so how do we think about that in in different more healing ways um there's a lot of work to do around that I wonder whether you need to get older to get there, though, you know, because I think at least for me, you know, I had to go through that painful understanding and experiencing it and being passive about what I was observing and being a part of about needing to have life sort of come around and smack me really hard a few times before I woke up and I said, oh, God, now I can't hide anymore. I have to do something about this. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wonder whether like I, I wouldn't have become who I am today if it wasn't for those painful yeah experiences like coming to coming to this country it's like people are so keen to put you in a box right they want yeah. you to check off that box that says asks you whether you're asian or desi or they don't even have that like they they want you to classify yourself in a particular way like well, who are you and what does your name mean and why do you have to call yourself that and why can't you change it because it's easier so mm -hmm. it's almost like you're kind of stuck mm -hmm. going through these paces between your you know when you when you're old enough to be conscious to maybe later in your years when experiences come along and sort of shift your thinking and you're almost forced to think a little bit differently because you're so unhappy with how things are yeah. going that there has to be a different way to see it yeah. I feel I mean I feel that um you know as I as I hear all of us reflecting and and um, Shadia most recently in your reflections I uh, again going back and thank you Sumi for like uplifting the term messiness I like where I honestly need to still like I just so much healing um is I have anger around ways that I feel like I have been used as a tool of anti-blackness even in my own leadership progression right um and at the same time also not recognized for the very good and amazing ways that I'm able to do anti-racism work. And so like, it's not enough, even, even in those spaces and ways. And I, I mean, I don't, again, so back to, if any of y'all have a solution around that, you know, uh, Sum and Penicor consulting, you know, I'll, I'll come to you, but like, th this is like, this is, I think the, the, um, a space where, um, I, I feel like I never have agency of who I get to be. Um, I mean, I, I guess I do, but we do, but people are always defining for us our identities. I don't know if y'all mm -hmm. have had those kinds of experiences, mm -hmm. anyone want to share, like, you know, in what ways maybe your identities may have been defined for you or how it situates you. I think people don't expect, I, I, I can bet that from a lot of us, people have not expected us to voice a critique and that first time. <laughs> We open our mouths and voice a meaningful critique of a structure, a process, an outcome, a decision. There's some whiplash that people yeah. have, right? Uh, and I, I think that is that's such an accurate description, Mamta, of of the way the hypervisibility and invisibility plays out at the same time, right? How we can be commodified as tools of white supremacy in one breath, right. and then completely rendered. Um, sidebar on the next, right? So our own experiences with racialization, with um, subordination, minoritization mm -hmm. are quickly erased when not convenient or highlighted when convenient, mm -hmm. oftentimes mm -hmm. at the expense of other minoritized or marginalized communities. And mm -hmm. it is so constantly, I think, um, mm -hmm. I choose not to walk those lines. I think many of us get placed yeah those lines and yes. so we're not just asked to do our work like do your job or you know the 16 jobs we always have done mm -hmm. but also at the same time to shatter the expectations and the boxes that people have um put us in or yeah. have externally defined as mm -hmm. the roles or the lines we're supposed to walk right to mm -hmm. to make to make to make anti-racism work more palatable or whatever it might be right um 
yeah. So I just, I really resonate with that, that point that you brought up, right? This, the, the liminality of mm-hmm. our identities allows us and sometimes to be used if we're not actively pushing against it on really a regular and daily basis, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not just, that's for, for everyone, right? Yeah. For everyone I've worked with, white people, black people, yes, Latinx folks, right? Fellow Asian Americans um, that, right. that has been impacted. And of course, every community goes through them in their own ways, but you know, we're talking about us. So I think there's some mm-hmm. ways that we can allow ourselves to be done dirty if we're not mm-hmm. conscious and awake looking for right. um, how we're being manipulated. Mm-hmm. And I think even in our field of student affairs, um, I find oftentimes um, sort of this, um, you know, hidden rule uh, of, you know, like I think it, with any any place, you know, as we have these conversations about equity and inclusion and, you know, um, having more people at the table, I continue to feel that, yes, they are making room for folks of color. But even in those chairs that are being brought for folks of color to be at the table, somehow there's only one chair for like that one Desi woman. And it's it's actually really half a chair, probably, because typically a Desi man will probably get there first. Uh, right. <laughs> um, and and. and Somehow there is this unwritten but understood sort of quota, uh, you know, of, Mm -hmm. okay, here's the people of color. Okay, let's make sure we have a lot of black and brown people. And by brown, you know, we're really looking at Latinx people. Oh, and then, yes, we've got to have the Asian Americans. Oh, but yeah, we we, we need like one fourth. And oh, if someone that looks like us has already been at the table, well, then, you know, we've done our job. So we're we're good. Go talk to that person who was at the table, right? and I find that some that, that comes up a lot, um, and I've had to have very very frank conversations yes. with recruiters. Um, when I, you know, when a recruiter will call me about a position, um, I no longer feel sort of drawn into their uh, narrative of how wonderful I am, uh, and I oftentimes cut to the chase of, "Are you trying to get a diverse candidate?" Um, <laughs> because I don't want to be just your diverse diversity candidate. I don't want to be that finalist. Uh, you know, who brings some melatonin in, but really you've already made up your mind about who you want to go with. Um, right. Or, <laughs> you know, it'll actually be really good to have two women of color, but we all know, you know, it's going to be um, the, the 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 Black woman. Or So there's this racial politics where we are, um, I just feel so many times that, uh, again, to Sumi's point, we're just sort of placed and forced upon. And I have, I am trying to learn ways of sort of uh, saying, no, I, I don't want to play that role, right? Yeah. Even in our professional associations, um, I feel like there are times when it's like, oh, well, we've had this person do this sort of leadership role, but so there's really no need for another South Asian woman to be at the table, right? Um, mm-hmm. And and we've got to find a way to sort of break that, um, you know, and 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 I've come to a point where I, I, I'm no longer interested in playing that game uh, of trying to get myself to the table. I'll just, you know, I'll bring my own folding chair if I need to, <laughs> or hell, I'm, I'm going to stand on that table and make some noise. We're actually bringing, you know, those rollout reed mats we have in our, um, yeah, I know. Our yes. home in India. I'm bringing the mat. That's <laughs> a chakai. No, I was just get saying, the chakai. Well, y'all, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm literally sitting on the floor right now. Like, so <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, there's lots of floor space. I mean, and yeah, I, so powerful. I think I think also to Smita's point, you know, I I have run the danger of being very typecast as the the cleanup gal, right? The person who comes <laughs> in and I'm the person who tends to be, oh yeah, she'll do a great bang up cleanup job. So let's hire her to come in and clean up the mess. And you know, one of the things that a good friend of mine has coined is the word custodial leadership, which is an mm-hmm. idea where you know women yeah. of color come in with their you know brooms and their dustpans. And are sort of allowed to clean up the house after the person before them has created a big fat mess, back to messy. So, you know, you reach a point in your career where you're like, I don't want to be the cleanup gal, right? It's it's that whole charu principle that, you know, we talk yes. about and laugh about a lot, Mamta. It's yeah. the charu meaning, you know, broom in Hindi or in Urdu. And it's a whole idea of, I don't want to bring my jaru anymore. I, I'm glad you're giving me the money that I can buy a Dyson and don't have to use a little <laughs> brush and pan, but mm-hmm. I'm kind of done with that. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of done with, with having that typecast role. 
just because I don't look a certain way or I don't speak a certain way or I have an accent or I wear a nose ring, like, mm -hmm. can we please grow up already and, and really bring in someone who can speak truth and that you actually want to hear the truth and do the truth as opposed to just sort of paying lip service to what you think you should be doing because everybody else is. Those are the the pieces that make me feel used for my body and my skin and my culture, right? There, yes. <clears throat> there are times and places where that happens all the time, right? But they just want us there as figureheads, right? Mm -hmm. We're not there because once we open our mouths and we mm -hmm. start with the, whether the resistance or the critique, uh, you know, dare, how dare we use our critical thinking right. skills mm -hmm. for the record. Mm -hmm. um, that's when the pushback is, well, now you're being too brown, right? Now you're being too Indian. Now you're, now it's too much. Just mm -hmm. have your physical place be there and keep your mouth shut, right? That's how, that's how diversity works. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's in my head right now? Because Shadia brought it up. And this is what is, is literally streaming through my head. The Chadu principle. Whoa. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I, sing it out loud. Uh, <laughs> I see a music video in our future. That's right. I mean, That's right. absolutely. That's our next podcast. That's right. <laughs> and Janet Jackson will join us. <laughs> So as you know, as we're talking about, you know, I, I love hearing that, you know, as we, you know, again, unfolding into ourselves, acknowledging, you know, um, the different privileged identities um, that come with with our, our, our bodies and skins and identities. Um, how, how do you reclaim or claim your abundance now? And, and how do you find your people? Sumi found me at Encore. I'm just going to say. The first <laughs> Desi I met in student affairs was, uh, if many of you know Raja uh, Butter, and we Raja was coming down an escalator. I was going up an escalator at a conference, and we just looked at each other, and mm -hmm. Raja was wearing a scarf, obviously, right? So <laughs> going, I was going up, and I was like, how do I find them? How do I find this person? And so... I ran around looking for the person with the scarf and I found them. And um, I think that was the beginning, right? Once you, uh -huh. you, you got to start connecting with folks somehow and conferences are a good way. Yeah. I think that's the best part too, right? When you see someone who looks like you, who has your skin, like there yeah. is no, <laughs> there, there, you can just forget the hidden agendas. Like there's no, <laughs> there's no formality there. It's just like, hi, how are you? Or namaste or salam alaikum or Oh my God, I'm so happy to see you. Like there, there doesn't have to be any sort of fake yeah. words. It's just well, automatic. Well, I think it's funny, right? So I think about, you know, the stories and even seeing it growing up in my childhood, right? Like my mother stopping somebody at like a grocery store and like, yes. oh my gosh, like, and then me <laughs> doing the same, I think it was to Ankita. Um, um, and to, I, I feel like I was, she was sitting outside and I was like, are you my kind of brown? Come with me, right? Yes. <laughs> and I, I'm like, I, I think I might've scared her when we first yeah. met. But then at the same time, like, I'm also, I mean, just reflecting back on the, I think uh, probably y'all heard the story, but at the the last NASPA conference, there was a, there was a, a, a early career professional who came up to me and, and said, what do I call you? And I was thinking like my mumta or like Dr. Ark, but like, you know, I didn't understand what she was asking. And she was like, do I call you auntie? And it oh, was, uh. <laughs> it, it was, well, actually it was really endearing to me and you know I was like yes like <laughs> what but but, yeah. but it was just like the I guess what I saw in her voice was that desire for affection and connection right yeah. like I think that that's what I was looking for like where are the us's for us right. um yeah. and so to be the and, us's and, for and us respect. and respect right like that's yeah like, reverence really respect. beautiful thing that she was mm -hmm. she was trying to honor yeah. you and what yes. you did to her so even though I tease you don't let her call you auntie yeah. <laughs> the reason she brought that up is because it's a, it is a sign of her respect mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. yeah, call me apa or you know didi or right. auntie always you know I, I call well we all call our aunties like always so uh, many years older and god yes. help me if I've hit that age because I don't really <laughs> want to be that age <laughs> 
You know, I find I find my joy in addition to just seeing our community growing at every NASPA. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's so joyous. For me, the everyday places where I find joy is actually to see our students. Um, yeah. You know, and to see they see students on our college campuses um, thriving um, and yeah. finding their voices um, and having you know beautiful loud voices um, that you know, I didn't have in, when I was in yeah. college. Um, and, you know, like one of the most joyous moments for me this past fall here at Middlebury was, you know, for the first time, um, I couldn't do this last year when I was here because of COVID, I opened my house for the Diwali celebration. Um, mm-hmm. And I plan to do that, you know, for Eid, for, uh, you know, a, an iftar dinner. But to, to be able to open my house, um, it was challenging to find good Indian food in Middlebury, Vermont, but we do have an <laughs> Indian restaurant here. Um but, you know, we invited <laughs> about 50 students and they all showed up and, you know, they asked if some of their friends could come. Um, and I, I invited some Indian faculty um, and I got this note from a mother in India whose son yeah. is a first year student. And she wrote this note um, that just brought tears to my eyes. And she said, knowing that my child had some place to go on Diwali, on his first Diwali that was going to yes. be away from home uh, means the world to me. Right. Um and so to see the joy where, you know, I had students sitting on the floor, we were listening to Bollywood mm-hmm. music and suddenly there was impromptu dancing happening. Um, those are the moments that fill, fill, fill us with joy as well, because at the end of the day, you know, we're doing this work for, 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 for our students. And, mm-hmm. you know, while there might be only one of us at a time allowed at a table, our students are coming in large numbers to our college. Yes. Um, yes. And it is so important for them to see us there. There are more international students from India than anywhere else in the world coming to the U.S. for higher education, Mm -hmm. right? Our, um, not only our presence, right, but the knowledge we have from our lived experiences, both folks who are children of immigrants and those who are immigrants to this country. Right. Right. I think we have, we have a lot of work ahead of us, honestly, in terms of supporting our students um, the way you you have been able to, Smita. And, you know, I've had similar experiences where, you know, the Indian students are just so excited, right? They're like, yes, we're having a Diwali party. Will you come? And what can you can you tell us the best restaurant and all of this? Right. That part is so much fun. Yeah. Um, And we have responsibilities, I think, as part of our roles to ensure that our campuses are also ready, ready uh, to be serving and supporting this large volume of international students uh in an appropriate way and there you know we were talking about anti-blackness earlier and you know one of you all know this something that's been on my mind is how do we work with international indian students to understand Mm -hmm. the concepts of anti-blackness yeah it's very different for folks who were raised in this country or have lived here for substantial periods of time and we're talking about brand new students coming to this country and we 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 have to work with our Indian students. And it's not just about the experiences of black students right. at those campuses, right? right? This right. is also about them going into the world and world. careers right. and so much more, right? And just, uh, and, and being good humans and knowing, right? A, lo- a lot of this is just understanding and acknowledging it right. to know that these behaviors exist within oneself. And I don't think most of these folks are coming here maliciously, but it's it's right. those learned learn behaviors and acts and thoughts that we have to, I think Sumi, you were talking about earlier, how do we help folks unlearn all of this? Yeah. Well, I see, I think though, you know, as I hear you reflect on that, absolutely. That, that is our responsibility. And I think, and many of us do engage in, you know, DEI and social justice education Mm -hmm. efforts on our own campuses. We also do that in a non-global context, right? So I think we, as our institutions have a responsibility to talk about anti-Blackness in a global way. Um, not, I mean, yes, the, you know, international students from India are, you know, are coming here. And so they have to understand the, the geography, the context of the geography that they're in. But for them to understand that, we should all understand a global Absolutely. context of anti-Blackness, right? And And I think that's where... Um, sometimes I think that our DEI initiatives and practices are um, not as strong as they could be, right, on, on our campuses and, and, and how we engage in our practices. I'm jump yeah. in on that. Let's be really explicit. I think that the um, American exceptionalism plays itself out mm-hmm. through 
how yeah. delimiting the constructs of the discussion of race and racism are in the U.S. This, yeah. I, I think that not always, but so many times, um, the discussion, teaching, and transformation about racial injustice, racial inequity falls so flat and so short because of the narrowness of the parameters mm -hmm. with Absolutely. which and many U.S.-based uh, racial justice and DEI practitioners are engaging with it. It is, it is, it is so U.S. centric and misses yeah. the boat on so many Absolutely. different levels. And and it really is. It is extremely frustrating because for the vast majority of, for example, Asian communities, two thirds of all of yes, our communities, yes. all Asian communities, South Asian, East Asian, yeah. et cetera, are still immigrant communities, right? Yeah. Yes. So then holding that sort of global lens um, about teaching, training, facilitating requires for US-based practitioners to actually shatter their own, the way they've imbibed yes. American exceptionalism. And so whether you're a black practitioner, white practitioner, Asian practitioner, whoever, there's some unlearning that needs to happen there um, and some right. real pushing beyond some of the narrow parameters that it's been constructed under, which I find really flawed. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Bringing in the lightness here, I see. There's so much work to do. <laughs> so, yeah. There's so much work to do. So in, in, in the so much work to do, we could talk for days and I know that our time is is uh, slowly coming to a close. Um, how, how do you um, sit in cultural, and it doesn't have to be cultural spaces, but cultural traditions or practices or what you do to lift yourself up um, and honor yourself amidst all of the heavy things we've talked about? I love that question. I think forums like this are deeply, mm. deeply powerful for me. They, they really bring me a lot of joy. And what is the word, you know, aram? Like they give me a yeah. lot of peace. What is what is the Hindi Urdu word for peace? Shanti? Shanti. They, they give Shanti. me a lot of, yeah, I feel a lot of uh, peace um, when I'm in these conversations because I'm with people who, who get it, but who also bring a different nuance and a different kind of understanding, which helps to shape my perspective and makes me, grow up a little bit even more from what I hear. Um, so it's it's really staying connected to other folks, really. It's through the connection. I'll say a form of cultural joy is I, I grew up on a steady diet of Indian movies. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's a film professor. Uh, so, and I know that Mumta and I share that, probably a couple of the rest of you share. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, I have the best memories and I still, I try to, you know, watch Indian movies with my kids too. And I'm being explicit about calling them Indian because we watched Hindi films, yeah. Bollywood movies, yeah. Telugu movies, Tamil movies, yeah. Kata movies, Malayalam movies, because India has the largest film industry yes, in the whole world. And we're so blessed to have that for all its problematics. Mm -hmm. But damn, that shit is good, y'all. Um, <laughs> I have the best memories of going to, you know, uh, East West video and movie. <laughs> on Devon Avenue and Chicago and Atlantic video and getting those fifth generation videos. Do y'all remember the camera? Oh camera? yeah. yeah. Bootleg. <laughs> they have the Cheddi ads on the bottom yeah. of the screen. And you're like, you can't quite see because I'm talking about eight eighties and early nineties y'all. Um, and that's actually how I learned to learn Hindi. We speak Canada at yeah. home. I learned Hindi entirely by watching Hindi films. So, and uh, turned out it all played out nicely because I married an actor. So, uh, you know, <laughs> Filling my destiny. There. <laughs> that brings me tons of joy. So I'll be watching Amarek for Anthony again at some point. Oh my God, that is oh, a great movie. Okay, oh, well, Sumi, Sumi called me and started singing the songs like a couple of weeks ago. Like, <laughs> well, like I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> other, other Bachchan can never get old, right? No. Mm -mm. He has aged gracefully. No jhadu for him. No. I know, no jhadu for him. No. I mean, you know, <laughs> politics, politics. Yes. Yeah, I know. that's one of those places where I, I turn off my brain. A yeah, I yeah. Know. Yeah. Yes, we I have, have to, to own my stuff there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think for me, it's the, you know, reflection of the folks who have come before um, any of you on this call, but also like my grandparents and my, you know, and all those struggles that they've gone through to make sure that I am where I am. Um, but also the, the, 
the youths that are coming after us. Um, <laughs> yes. Right. That I have students so who are joyful. thrilled that I'm here and they're like, Shruti, we need you to do better. We got to yes. push back and this is inequitable. And, and I, so I love the both and right. Um, mm -hmm. Where I would have never pushed back on a, on a quote unquote elder. Um, and now they're like, we love you. We can you come speak at a was and all these things are inequitable. Um, so yeah. just gives me a little bit of, like hope in, yes. in, in who's coming. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I'm so grateful um, to all of you. And I know, again, as I could talk to you for days, maybe we need a part two at some point. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll be calling you for that. Um, but for now, um, thank you so much, my dear sisters, Smita, Pia, Sumi, Shadia, Shruti. Um, for your presence, your ancestral wisdom, your life stories, your spirit on, on this specific episode of Student Affairs Now. Um, thank you all for paving the way, not only for our profession, but also uh, truly for our collective communities overall, um, by demonstrating your ways of being and knowing. Um, the, I, I can never say it enough. I love you all so deeply. I need you to know that I, um, you know, on our journeys, uh, maybe you have felt this way. I have at times felt very, very alone and very lonely. And to be in this space, like with, with all of you um, is a reminder, not only for myself, but for everyone else out there, we're, we're not alone. Um, yeah. And, you know, just holding on to each other um, has been one of the greatest gifts and blessings in, in my life and journey. Um, with that, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors again. So thank you to our sponsors, Leadership and Vector Solutions. We appreciate your support. Leadership partners with colleges and universities to create transformational leadership experiences, both virtual and in person for students and professionals with a focus on creating a more just, caring, and thriving world. Leadership offers engaging learning experiences on courageous dialogue, integrity, equity, resilience, and community building. To find out more, please visit leadershape.org backslash virtual programs or connect with them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. How will your institution rise to reach today's socially conscious generation? These students report commitments to safety, well-being, and inclusion as are most as are as important as academic rigor when selecting a college. It's time to re reimagine the work of student affairs as an investment, not an expense. For over 20 years, Vector Solutions, which now includes the Campus Prevention Network, formerly known as EverFi, has been the partner of choice for over 2,000 colleges, uni universities, and national organizations. With nine efficacy studies behind their courses, you can trust and have full confidence that you're using the standard of care for student safety, well-being, and inclusion. Transform the future of your institution and the community you serve. Learn more at VectorSolutions.com backslash student affairs now. Much love and a huge shout out to Natalie Ambrosi, the producer for this podcast, who does all of the behind the scenes work to make us look good and sound good. Thank you so much, Natalie. If you're listening today and not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please visit our website at Student Affairs Now and scroll to the bottom of the homepage to add your email to our MailChimp list. While you're there, check out the archives. I'm Mamta Akapati. Much love and gratitude to everyone who is watching and listening. Please make it a beautiful week that honors your soul and spirit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. <laughs>